Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's presentation. We're going to begin now. Um, I'd like to introduce the speaker for today's talk, Mr. Evan Weiner. He is an author and also has a background in television and radio. And he'll be discussing Ted Turner and how he changed communication. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to leave their audio on mute. Um, and if you have any questions at the end, please enter them in the chat at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Ever Evan Weiner. Thank you, Sharon, and thank Darren for inviting me for a second time uh, to the library here on this uh, very warm and toasty Saturday uh, morning. And, uh, and this will be on tape, so wherever you are in the world watching this, uh, thanks uh, for tuning in. And again, thank the uh, Plainsboro Library for inviting me. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner, and uh, I never worked for Ted Turner, but I uh, did spend some time with him. And more importantly, uh, the guy in the middle there is Harvey Schiller, uh, who is a uh, old friend of mine who uh, was one of Ted's vice presidents. Uh, a lot of uh, what I'm going to talk about comes from people like Harvey, from the late Jack Kelly, from uh, Jeff Grimshaw, who is not here today. Uh, Jeff is uh, in Virginia Beach. And uh, all of them will tell you, well, Jack can't now because he passed away, but all of them will tell you that uh, Ted Turner was a dream to work for, one of the easiest people, because he hired you and he said, do your job. And if you did your job, Ted had no problems with it. My background, um, radio and TV, I started in 1971. I was at Spring Valley High School. That's in Muncie, New York, in Rockland County, about 25 miles north of Manhattan. And I was in 11th grade, and I had a teacher by the name of Joe Dionisio, 11th grade English, at Spring Valley High School. And Joe, uh, Joe had this thing, he didn't know any, any of our names. And he used to say, student, student, student. And I still talk to Joe 49 years later because Joe opened all kinds of doors for me as my 11th grade teacher. He said, you got a good voice. How would you like to be on radio? And I said, I'd love to be on radio in the worst way, in the worst way, in the worst way. And I was. Uh, I was with a show called Tiger Talk. That's Spring Valley High School. It was on for 15 minutes every Tuesday afternoon at 3.45 in the afternoon on WRKL radio, 910 and the dial which would not reach uh, Plainsboro or Princeton uh, because it was a 1,000 watt station. And so we were on, and uh, Joe also opened the door for me to work at the Nyack Journal News and also in uh, Bergen County, the Hackensack Record. I had three stints at the Hackensack Record as a high school uh, student um, after college and uh, in the 2000s in the 21st century where I wrote op-ed pieces for them until the op-ed department disappeared. Um, in 1978, six and a half years later, working for a radio station, WGRC Nanuet, New York, which you wouldn't get down there. And uh, Steve, North, Steve North is my boss and he hires me uh, right around Christmas 1977 with the understanding I would work on Saturdays, which he involved in it. And, um, Rockland Community College had a speaker series, and immediately uh, I had uh, people like Ralph Nader to interview, uh, along with um, Julian Bond. And it's a Saturday uh, in late March of 1978, still 21 years old. I've been out of college for a while, and somebody uh, is a scribble on there for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Steve sends me, uh, sends me out to cover the New York State Democrats for having a fundraiser. And uh, he said, go cover it Saturday. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it on uh, Monday morning. And he said that uh, you don't have to file anything unless you get something big. And I go to the Tappan Zee townhouse in Nyack. And uh, it's a who's who of New York State Democrats in 1978. You carry running for governor is there. Uh, the first guy I see is an obscure assemblyman by the name of uh, Jerome Nadler, uh, who you might have heard of recently. He was one of the uh, House impeachment managers, congressman from New York. Um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, senator from New York, was there. And uh, Mario Cuomo, he was running for go a lieutenant governor, and he brings his uh, teenage son, Andrew, with him, his small son, 
Chris with him, Matilda, his wife is there. And then there's a tall guy that walks in, tall guy, good looking guy, about six foot four, sandy blonde hair, and I'm 21, big hair and all that other stuff, 1978. And he looks at me and says, I like you. Yeah. And he says, I want to tell you something. He never introduced himself to me, but I knew who he was, John Lindsay, former mayor of New York City. He said, I'm running for Senate, state of New York, 1980. Boom, got my scoop, run back to my station, uh, file it for my station, file it with the Associated Press, file it with United Press International. And then I get a call from WNEW Radio, 50,000 watt New York City radio station, which you do get down there. It's now WBBR, Bloomberg Radio. And um, Henry Marcotte's on the phone. He says, how would you like to do that story for us? I said, sure, how much are you going to pay me? 10 bucks, sold. And with that, at the age of 21, I was on New York City radio for about three and a half years covering news. So, uh, and that's approximately the same time that Ted Turner would start CNN. Guy in the middle there is Harvey Schiller. Harvey Schiller was a vice president with Ted Turner. And part of this talk comes from Harvey. Part of the talk comes from Jack Kelly, the other part of the talk from Jeff Grimshaw. This is 2002, the day I met Miss Universe, 2002, and uh, it was a big party that Harvey was there. Call him Ted. Ted Turner changed your life in more ways than one. Doesn't matter if you're a news junkie or not, or can't stand news. He came up with CNN. Doesn't matter whether you like cartoons or not. He came up with the Cartoon Network. Doesn't matter if you like classic movies or not. He came up with Turner Classic Movies. Also tried to colorize some of the most famous black and white movies ever, which didn't exactly work out. If you liked yachting or knew anything about yachting, you knew about him because he won the America's Cup uh, in the 1970s. Um, and it was... This guy is probably one of the most unlikely people you would ever think to have impact on your life, on your lives, but he did on television, basically, uh, and also in sports, mostly in television. And uh, he was called Captain Outrageous, Ted Turner, there's me and Harvey, Harvey, who was uh, at many times the second man uh, at TBS or at Turner Sports, or even at just overall the Turner Networks. And uh, Harvey is an old friend of mine going back a long time. And I first met him uh, with uh, Ted uh, when they were doing NFL football back in the 1990s. Harvey Schiller was the aide de camp. He also put together the America's Cup in Bermuda in 2027, 2017 rather, uh, helped put that together. The America's Cup. Ted Turner, when he was 26 years old, that was in 1964, started in sailing competitions at the Savannah Yacht Club, competing in the Olympic trials in 1964. So he was, well, I'm not sure, I guess back in those days, if you were the head of a yacht, because you did do physical work on the yacht, uh, I guess you were an athlete. Uh, and uh, he was obviously an international world-class athlete. Uh, in sailing, he appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated on the 4th of July, 1977, after he was chosen to lead the 1977 America's Cup defense as the skipper of the yacht Courageous. By September 18th, 1977, he was successfully defending the America's Cup, defeating Australia for nothing. While he was doing all of this, he was putting together... WTBS, or Superstation Channel 17, which you probably remember out of Atlanta. He's looking to start a cable news network. He buys the Atlanta Braves baseball team, of which he would manage for one day. He's all over the place, seemingly never sleeping, whether it's sailing, whether it's running the baseball team, whether it's running a whole bunch of television networks and uh, taking advantage of what is going on at this point where satellites are being launched. And the satellites that are being launched are communication satellites. And Ted Turner has his eyes on the satellites, but at the same time, he's trying to figure out how to win the America's Cup. Um, he was inducted into the America's Cup Hall of Fame in 1993 and the National Sailing Hall of Fame in 2011. You would figure that would be enough accomplishments for anybody, but not for Ted Turner. Ted Turner, 
had too much on his plate. And if he wasn't sick right now, he'd still have a lot on his plate. Captain Outrageous, he brought international attention because he had a big mouth to the America's Cup. His uh, upset success with the defending boat in 1977, the 12-meter uh, aluminum courageous, his antics during and immediately after the Cup, coupled with his obvious master of sailboat race racing, made him popular and controversial. And this is what is on Ted Turner's plaque. Ted Turner is credited with drawing more attention to America's Cup competition than any other person in the long history of the Cup, which goes back to 1851. He had proven himself in ocean racing, winning most of the world's most prestigious races, including the Southern Ocean Racing Circuit twice. While he was doing this, he was trying to become a television pioneer. The plaque in 1974, he was at the helm of the contender Mariner, which was eliminated in early in the Defender Trials. Many credit the disastrous 1974 Mariner campaign with sparking Ted Turner's success aboard Courageous in 1977. Courageous dominated the final trials, giving Ted Turner a personal triumph. Shouldn't be surprising, Ted Turner had to take over his father's billboard company. Uh, when he was about 26 years old, uh, or younger than that, because his father committed suicide and all of a sudden Ted is in charge of this company. So he's all over the place. The cup races were a disappointment with Courageous winning four straight races against Australia at the start. Australia never at any point had a lead in any of the four races. Turner was the last true amateur to win the America's Cup. Glories in head to head competition he came back in 1980, roughly at the same time he starts CNN, hoping to make uh, it uh, America, the uh, three-time defending champion, uh, but uh, another American boat sailed by S Dennis Connor of San Diego, who I also knew, being him. Captain Outrageous. He spoke his mind. He was known as the Mouth of the South. He's the only man voted Yachtsman of the Year four times, and probably the last amateur skipper that will ever win the America's Cup. Now, the guy, now you see me sitting on the right. This is in 2005. The guy all the way on the left looking toward me is Jack Kelly, who is another vice president. And as I told Sharon, he was uh, the head of uh, the Cartoon Network for a while. He had to ditch me one day on the phone. He says, got to go. I said, what's up? He says, I got to talk to Hannah and Barbera. We're talking about maybe doing something with a new Yogi Bear, because he was the head of the Cartoon Network. By the way, not off the beaten path, as you can see me sitting here on the right side. The guy next to me is a guy by the name of Jack Langle. Jack Langle was portrayed in a movie about Marshall University, and Marshall University in the 1970s, half their football team was killed in a plane crash. And Jack Langle, including the coach, Jack Langle stepped in and rebuilt the Marshall football program out of the uh, ashes of, of the plane crash. And the only reason I'm bringing him up, does he look like Matthew McConaughey? Because Matthew McConaughey played him in the movie about Marshall. Uh, so that's my buddy Jack Langle, who was played in the movie by Matthew McConaughey. So it's a family business that Ted Turner would take over at the age of 25. The media empire would start with his father's billboard business, Turner Outdoor Advertising. He takes over the business in 1963 because his father committed suicide. His father was an alcoholic, and 25-year-old Ted Turner now is in charge of the whole enterprise, which was a sizable billboard business. You know, the billboards that you see on the highways or on the streets, Turner Outdoor Advertising, that was his father. Turner would go into the television business in 1970. He would acquire an independent, low-rated UHF station, Channel 17. In 1976, Ted Turner would purchase Major League Baseball's Atlanta Braves. It would also launch TBS Superstation, which was Channel 17, originating the St Superstation concept. The following year, Turner Broadcasting System, Inc., acquired the National Basketball Association's Atlanta Hawks. And in 1980, Ted Turner launched CNN, which would be the first live 
24-hour global news network. So Ted Turner was a madman, absolute madman to the extreme. The television station that he got was a failing TV station that had third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh run programming and a bunch of movies. It really didn't have much. It wasn't making very much money. Turner would quickly change the call letters of Channel 17 to WTCG, which stood for Watch This Channel Grow. Initially, the station ran old movies from the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, along with theatrical cartoons and very old sitcoms and drama shows. Out of that station, the idea would be Turner Classic Movies. Out of that station would come the Cartoon Network. 1970, these, were, these weren't even thought of. They weren't even, nobody dreamed about having a network or a station just that featured old movies or just featured cartoons. But it comes out of WTCG. Um, Turner was able to get over programming and he would pick it up at an extremely low price. And it was secondhand product or thirdhand product or fourthhand product. Shows like Gilligan's Island, I Love Lucy. Now you think of I Love Lucy, how could that be fourth or fifth ranked product? But by 1973, it was. Star Trek, Star Trek wasn't highly thought of until the movie came out. The movie came out, that changed everything for Star Trek. Hazel, I don't know how many of you remember Hazel, who was the maid of, of the uh, Baxter household. Bugs Bunny, the cartoons. The Bugs Bunny cartoons ran on kiddie shows across the country. That's all they did. And then in 1973, WTCG gets its first major property. It's going to carry Atlanta Braves baseball games. Things are happening. Things are happening rather quickly uh, in the satellite uh, business. The Federal Communications Commission in 1976 decided we're going to use some of our satellites and they can transmit content to local cable TV operators around the nation. And that's when Ted Turner becomes Ted Turner. And this is where all the ideas begin to percolate. On December 17th, 1976, WTCG TV became a superstation. And what was a superstation? Well, if you go back to the 1970s, not everybody was wired for cable TV. In fact, a lot of areas didn't have cable TV. Of those who did, the cable operators decide we're going to start not only showing basic, but we're going to have another tier. And on that another tier, we're going to throw on all kind of independent stations and increase, obviously, what they're charging for you. But we're going to have other fare. So you would buy cable TV. And uh, WTCG had old movies. They had the situation comedy reruns. They had the cartoons. And they had the sports, and they also had Atlanta Hawks uh, basketball at that time. And so they decided, you know what? Why don't we strike a deal and offer our program to cable subscribers or cable systems? And the cable system said, you know what? We think that station is going to attract people. We think we could get, we could sell our cable TV with stations like Channel 17. And this becomes a money winner for Ted Turner because he's able to increase his viewership and get additional advertising. And his Atlanta Braves baseball team, which he soon would get, would become a national team because it's seen on Channel 17. There were other super stations as well at that time. WWOR now, which was WOR in New York, Channel 9, WPIX, Channel 11 in New York, uh, WSBK Channel 38 in Boston, Massachusetts, all became superstations along with WGN in Chicago. We all figured we could get national money and we could do some national programming, which meant Boston Red Sox were on the air around the country, along with 
Chicago Cubs games and the Mets games and the uh, Yankees games, along with Braves games. This is a whole new world that opened up in 1976. But he's still, he has, it's, uh, he has his old call letters. He doesn't like his call letters. He wants to have sort of the broadcasting system because that's what he's building. But he has a problem. MIT has WTDS at their little station at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Technology Broadcasting System is what it was called. So Ted strikes a deal with MIT and he buys the rights to WTBS, WTBS, uh, for $50,000. And this is all part of marketing and all because Ted Turner now can strengthen the branding of his superstation also using TBS. Turner Communications Group is renamed the Turner Broadcasting System. WTCG, Channel 17, is uh, renamed WTBS. Now, on the baseball side, he has the Atlanta Braves, and he uh, dabbles in free agency. Free agency becomes a thing in 1976, and he signs Andy Messersmith to a big contract by 1977 standards, and there was a stipulation, Andy Messersmith wore the number 17. And instead of having number 17 on his back, Ted comes up with, hey, you know what? Why don't you become channel 17? That would help uh, sell the station. And he wears channel 17 briefly until Major League Baseball said he's not wearing channel 17. His name is Messersmith, not channel. But Ted tried to do that as well. So Ted is building this thing up and up and up. Uh, in 1976, Ted would buy uh, the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Hawks and what he wanted to do eventually, the Atlanta Hawks, and that was to uh, help with the programming of WTCG. Because he had a superstation, uh, whatever, whoever was subscribing to cable TV in 1976, 77, 78, would get Atlanta Braves games, along with the Chicago Cubs, the Red Sox, the Yankees, and the Mets. Turner would turn the Braves into a household name in the 1980s, and partly he would do that by starting games on Wednesday night at 5.30 and then put a movie on at 8 o'clock at night to make more movie off, money off the TV than the Braves games, but you had to go look for the Braves, and the Braves had some good teams in the 1980s, and they would be very successful in the 1990s. And Andy Messersmith changed his uh, name to Channel to help promote the TV station until uh, Major League Baseball said no. Now remember, Ted Turner is doing the America's Cup in 1977, putting together television stations. He's doing all these things, and he's got the baseball team. He wants to see what's going on with the baseball team. This baseball team is not very good. It's losing a lot of games. And he decides, you know what? I want to see what's going on. I'm going to make myself the manager for one game. He makes himself the manager for one game. May 11th, 1977. Now, he didn't know any strategy. He was there just to see what was going on. And the coaches did most of the work because he really didn't know anything about baseball. The next day, Major League Baseball put a stop to it immediately. No owner could uh, manage a team, although George Steinbrenner and the New York Yankees tried to do it, along with Charlie Finley, who owned the Kansas City and Oakland A's. And Ted was uh, really upset about the rule. They must have put that rule in yesterday. If I'm smart enough to save up $11 million to buy the team, I ought to be smart enough to manage it. They wouldn't let him manage it. The way things are going, when things are going bad, there are 10,000 guys in the stands who think, if only I could take over this ball club for a while, I'd straighten them out. But Kuhn, the Major League Baseball Commissioner, Bowie Kuhn, said I couldn't manage again. I asked him if I, it was okay if I went manager of the minors for a year and really learned how to do it. He said, no. I don't know when he would have had time to do that, considering everything else that he was doing at the time in 1977, including being in the America's Cup. This is CNN, and there's me in the middle uh, with Harvey Meyerson, Donald Trump's attorney in the uh, 1986 USFL-NFL antitrust suit. Meyerson won the suit, but ended up uh, losing, uh, losing the suit because uh, the jury only gave a $1 verdict to the USFL, and Harvey 
messed it up uh, by not to stop, uh, by allowing the trial to stop instead of asking the jurors, why'd you only give a buck? Harvey would end up in jail uh, about four or five years later for bilking clients, uh, Harvey Myerson. But uh, that's me and uh, I'm next to him. But the only reason I use that picture is that it's got the CNN mic flagging. Uh, it was, uh, that was Jamie Morrison's mic flag uh, at the time. Jamie was the producer uh, that was covering that trial that uh, was in uh, lower Manhattan at Foley Square. And behind him is Bruce Morton, who didn't wake up this morning to watch this, but I'm sure he'll watch it on uh, replay. Uh, anyway, this is CNN. CNN starts July 1st, 1980, 40th anniversary of CNN took place 25 days ago. Ted said, we won't be signing off until the world ends. We'll be on, and we'll cover the end of the world live, and that will be our last event. We'll play near my God to thee before we sign off, which is what the orchestra played before the Titanic finally sunk. According to Jeff Grimshaw, who's using his sailboat right now in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and he's not here, I will remind him of that. A video exists where Ted imitates Porky Pig, and that's the last thing you were supposed to see on CNN as the world ends, is Ted Turner saying, no, 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 that's all, folks. CNN almost didn't get to the end of the world. CNN was losing a million dollars a month when it started in 1980, which meant it was on for the last six months of the year, which meant it lost $6 million. Not exactly a big figure today, but back in 19 figure, in 1980, that was a big figure. That was $12 million a year. Um, CNN was in Atlanta, and there were reasons why CNN was in Atlanta, not New York. Now, Turner had his other networks in Atlanta. His TV stations were based down there. But New York is the financial capital of the world. Nobody's going to argue that. Washington is the, is the seat of power in the United States. Nobody's going to argue that. Ted Turner went to all the banks in New York and asked for money to help get CNN off the ground. And he was turned down by all the banks, and with good reason. Um, I worked at WNEW, as I said at the beginning of, the, um, of this talk, broadcast. It will be a broadcast, as you get in the video. And um, in those days, my news director was a guy by the name of Sam Hall. He taught me a lot. Sam was really good and helped me out a lot, along with Mike Eisgrow and some of the other people at WNEW Radio. And uh, Sam had just come out of a situation where NBC was trying to put together a national news radio network. Uh, and it was called The Source, and uh, it didn't get off the ground. I was also part of a, a group in 1984, a sports news network, sports radio network, that we couldn't get off the ground. It just wasn't feasible. When people talked about putting together a cable television news network, they got laughed at. Nobody believed that you could do news for 24 hours a day. Nobody believed anybody would watch news 24 hours a day. Nobody believed that people would actually pay for news 24 hours a day or get advertising for news 24 hours a day. So they went to all the banks in New York and the banks said, no, we're not gonna do it. This is a money loser. There's no way this is gonna work. It sounds like a good idea on paper, but it's not gonna work. Turner would go to Chicago and in Chicago, the banks would fund them. It was then and there that Turner decided that I'm not going to New York. I'm not going to Washington. They both turned their back. Well, the New York bankers turned their backs on us. So why should I go to New York? Why should I go to Washington for our headquarters? I'm going to go in Atlanta. We got all of our other stuff here in Atlanta. I'm going to stay in Atlanta. Ted was the only one who thought it would work. He rolled the dice. Absolutely took a major roll of the dice. It was a money loser. And he was a money loser. Now, back in those days, um, there was no government protection for all these networks, whether it was CNN, whether it was ESPN. ESPN, 80% uh, of ESPN's money came from Getty Oil. The other 20%, rather, 80% came from Budweiser and 20% came from Getty Oil. But they really weren't getting any money from the cable operators. And that's where cable 
television stations make their money, getting fees, getting the subscriber fees, put back into the network. It wasn't that way in 1979, which is why it was thought it was going to be a money loser. Now, it was a money loser until 1984. 1984, there was the passage of the Cable TV Act by Ronald Reagan. It was worked on by both sides of uh, Congress, the House and Senate, with a lot of people lobbying. In fact, to this day, the cable TV lobby is one of the largest lobbies in Washington, D.C. Telecommunications uh, corporations and companies and pharmaceutical companies are two of the biggest, if not the two biggest, lobbyists up on Capitol Hill in Washington. The passage of the Cable TV Act of 1984 by Congress was signed into law by Ronald Reagan. It more than likely saved Ted Turner CNN along with Ted Turner's T TBS, along with non-Turner properties such as ESPN and the Weather Channel. The cable TV networks were taken as one, CNN, TBS, the Weather Channel, ESPN, all bundled as into one cable package. And the one cable package was sold to you, whether you wanted it or not. By 1984, 85, you had basic expanded, you had the basic, and that's it. Those were your choices. You could not cherry pick on the basic expanded. So say if you want to just CNN, well, you couldn't do that without ESPN or the Weather Channel. And it's that way until this day. You wouldn't go into a grocery store and you wouldn't buy, you wouldn't go to checkout and they would say, well, I see you got breakfast stuff. That's good. That's all you want? Well, you got to get some DW40. And you gotta get some motor oil, and you gotta get some Windex, and you gotta get scotch tape, and you put it all together, and we check you out. And by the way, you get one bill. You don't get it itemized. You don't get it itemized. That's what happened with cable TV. You went to the supermarket, and they did that to you in the supermarket, you would never go back to that supermarket. But you do with cable TV because it's federal law that they can get away with bundling packages and you don't need to know how much you're paying. You don't need to know you're paying about $7 a month for ESPN. You don't need to know that you're paying today about a buck 25 a month for uh, CNN or about a buck a month for uh, Fox News Channel. You don't need to know that. You don't know that. And you're never going to know that. I happen to know that because I'm in the business, but they don't want to do that. The bundling concept came as part of the 1984 TV Act, and that socialized cable TV. All the consumers paid, all the consumers paid for all the networks on the basic expanded tier, whether the consumer watched all the networks or just one or two of the networks. Cable TV became socialized, thanks to Ronald Reagan's pen. And if you don't believe me, look at the law and you'll understand after you read through the law how the cable operators collected the fees and then passed the fees on to the cable TV networks. Cable TV networks had all of this money all of a sudden that kept them going, particularly ESPN, which would then take some of that money and give it to sports teams and regional sports networks, whether it's the Yes Network in New York or MSG or SNY or down in Philadelphia, the Comcast uh, system or up in uh, New England, Nesson, or down in Florida, the Sunshine Network. Um, they work the same way. Cable operators collect the money and then pass it on to them, and you don't know how much you're paying for that particular item. From one small company, Turner's company became a portfolio of cable television news and network, uh, entertainment brands, and business, and what you know today is CNN Headline News, which some of you might watch. CNN, CNN Headline News, CNN International, which sometimes is on CNN. Uh, TNT, the Cartoon Network, Turner Classic Movies. In the mid-1990s, any of you watch Seinfeld? Because if you watch Seinfeld, you are watching a Ted Turner product because the company that uh, was part of the Seinfeld package that put together Seinfeld named Castle Rock Entertainment. Owner, Ted Turner. New Line Cinema. They made movies. New Line Cinema, also Ted Turner. All became Turner Properties. 
Ted Turner was amassing this huge, huge, huge communications network. In 1996, the company would merge with Time Warner. In 2001, Time Warner would merge with AOL. They created AOL Time Warner, uh, which was one of the biggest disasters ever, ever in the United States commerce history. The company later changed back its name to Time Warner. AT&T would eventually buy Time Warner. Time Warner just spun off AOL. AOL is now a Verizon communications company. Uh, let's talk about the other networks here. A lot of you probably have watched Turner Network. In 1988, Ted Turner decided, remember those old movies that used to be on Channel 17? Remember all that? Well, he decided, let's do something on a grander scale. Turner Network Television, TNT. And the first show, Gone with the Wind, or first movie, Gone with the Wind. Now, Gone with the Wind is now owned by AT&T. And Gone with the Wind is now being rebranded to where there's a narrative in front talking about how this movie was made in 1939, and it was made in the context of what they knew then about the Civil War. Um, and so it, it's being branded or rebranded with the, with the clause saying, hey, this was made in 1939, 80 years ago, 81 years ago, all because of what's going on in the streets after the George Floyd murder. There's a lot of that going on uh, in entertainment and in sports. And uh, so Gone with the Wind is still available on television with a reminder that was made in 1939 when standards were different. TNT initially showed older movies and television shows, and then it added original programs and newer reruns. TNT also used World Championship Wrestling, WCW. They spent a lot of money on WCW, which would become the gold standard at Turner Broadcasting. It made more money than any other show. Uh, and they uh, used it to attract a broader audience, bringing in the wrestlers, and uh, that was the Dusty Rhodes people and eventually they would get Hulk Hogan in there uh, and eventually they would be canceled. Get into that in a few minutes. Uh, since the launch of uh, Turner Classic Movies, uh, which was uh, is TCM, uh, they broadcasted um, MGM, Warner Brothers and RKL li RKO libraries. Uh, in the mid-1980s, Ted made one of his few mistakes uh, he colorized a lot of those black and white movies in 1985. Yankee Doodle Dandy became the first black and white movie redistributed in color after computer coloring. And there was a lot of opposition to it by film aficionados and stars and directors. And they said, listen, the movie was done in black and white. It's not done in color. And some of those movies work a lot better in black and white than in color because of action or whatever. Uh, the movie, uh, the colorization now uh, did win over a section of the public. Turner colorized the majority of the movies he had owned, but by the mid 1990s, he abandons the idea partly, partly because it costs a lot of money to co uh, colorize the movies. Um, TCM, as opposed to TMT, uh, TNT, TCM. It's shown the original movies, always showed the original movies, and still shows the original movies uh, uncut. Uh, TNT played around with those movies. Jack Kelly ran the Cartoon Network, 1992. The pre May 1986 MGM library included Warner Brothers properties, included early Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. Also, the uh, Max Fleischer Studios, Max and Dave Fleischer. Uh, and famous studios, Popeye cartoons from United Artists, and they became the core of the Cartoon Network. Uh, a year before Turner's companies purchased Hannah and Barbera, they uh, uh, added that uh, content. In 1996, with the Time Warner merger, the marriage of the later Warner Brothers cartoons with the early cartoons, meant that Ted Turner had the complete run of cartoons from the days of Bosco, of Bosco to the 1964-65 cartoons. My friend Jack Kelly ran that business. Jack also ran the Goodwill Games for uh, Ted Turner in 1994, 98. If you work with Ted, you are good, 
Ted gave you a lot of responsibilities and Jack had a lot of responsibilities, as did Harvey Shore, as did Jeff Grimshaw. And uh, there is um, Jack, uh, fourth, uh, right, he's in the middle there, he's the fourth, uh, one, two, three, third to the right of me in that uh, picture. We were uh, on a panel together down in Daphne, Alabama, back in 2011. And uh, there I am talking to uh, Matthew McConaughey, right? Matthew McConaughey. Jack ran the uh, Goodwill Games in 1998. And Ted Turner decided that uh, he was going to be a champion for world peace. And he wanted to get the Soviet Union and the United States out of the Cold War and into a uh, detente, and he wanted to ease uh, the tensions between the two sides. So he thought, after seeing the 1980 Olympics, uh, where the Soviet Union was boycotted by uh, the United States and its allies, Canada, Japan, uh, but not England, um, and the Soviets paid uh, the favor back by boycotting the Los Angeles Games in 1984, with the Warsaw Pact countries, Ted decided, you know, I want to do something here, and, and I want to get all these countries together. The United States had uh, boycotted the 1980 uh, Moscow Olympic Games because uh, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan on the Christmas Eve in 1979. Um, the invasion of Afghanistan, and the United States decided to boycott the 80 Olympics in Moscow on uh, March 21st, 1980. Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries, with the exception of Romania, boycotted the Los Angeles games. So Ted is looking at this and said, what can I do to get the sides together? So Ted talks to the people in the Soviet Union and says, how about if we put together the Goodwill Games and you be the first toast? And Moscow was the first toast in 1986. And uh, one of the things that Ted did was sent his Atlanta Hawks basketball team to train uh, in the Soviet Union in, right after the Goodwill Games. And with that, he opened up the door for Russian players, Soviet players, to go back to the United States and play with NBA teams. So he's got his hands full, and he's trying to get world peace at this point. So ironically, the NBA's road to globalization, and the NBA is as global as any league as possible, can be traced back to Ted Turner's rise as a cable TV mogul. Turner was trying to figure out how we could force an end to the Cold War with CNN International and his international sports event, the Goodwill Games, a friendly competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. That according to uh, Jack Kelly, one of the executives who would run the Goodwill Games. Moscow 1986 would lead to Moscow 1988. Hawks go for a training camp in 1889 in August. Turner receives a present from the falling apart Soviet Union. The Hawks sign Alexander Volkov in 1989. He was the second Soviet to sign with an NBA team that summer. The Golden State Warriors signed a deal with Sharunius Marchiulius in June of 1989. So, Ted might not have gotten world peace between the uh, United States and the Soviet Union, but he got Soviet players to come over to the United States and play uh, in the NBA. Soviets were letting their players leave to pursue uh, opportunities uh, elsewhere. Uh, uh, Sabonius was considered the best Soviet player, and he signed a deal with Club Barcelona Valladolid in Spain and then Real, Real Madrid and would become a member of the Portland Trailblazers in 1995. Now, trouble starts when Ted Turner is bought out by Time Warner in 1996. The games were bought out from Turner. Hostile merger. Uh, Ted Turner did not want to give up the Turner Broadcasting System, but was forced to do so. Time Warner would organize a 2001 version of the Goodwill Games in Brisbane, Australia. But Time Warner, once they took over the Turner properties, decided to take a hatchet to a lot of what Ted Turner did and kind of destroy it. And I'll give you some examples. The first to go, or one of the first to go, was the uh, Goodwill Games in 2001. Um, that would be it, 2001 Goodwill Games. 
uh, in 2009, Ted Turner was talking at the sport of court in Denver, Colorado, and he blamed the demise of the Goodwill Games on the short-sighted management of Time Warner. Instead, if I would have stayed there, the Goodwill Games would not have been canceled. Turner Broadcasting System merged with Time Warner October 10, 1996, hostile takeover. Turner stayed on as vice chairman and the head of Time Warner in Turner's Cable Networks division. But Turner was dropped as the, at the, as the head of the Cable Networks by the CEO, Gerald Levin. And that was a big, big mistake. I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Uh, but he remained vice chairman of Time Warner. He resigned from the Time Warner uh, as vice chairman in 2003 and the board of directors in 2006. One of the earliest shows to go was World Championship Wrestling. World Championship Wrestling was a highly, highly, highly successful show. But Gerald Levin had friends on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And as you find out from television executives, having friends on the Upper East Side of Manhattan probably isn't the greatest thing if you're a television broadcaster. William Paley had friends on the Upper East Side of Manhattan back in the 1960s, and William Paley's friends were embarrassed for him because he had Green Acres on, a show I love, by the way. He had Beverly Hillbilly Show, a show which was a groundbreaking show because it was the first show where a woman was the central business character in the show. Kate Bradley ran the Shady Rest Hotel, and she was making the business decisions. She was the first woman on TV to make business decisions. Petticoat Junction, think of that. They're supposed to be the rural shows. Green Acres, Mayberry, didn't like the Mayberry uh, RFD show. Uh, Beverly Hillbillies, got rid of all of those shows. Got rid of uh, the older skewing shows, which was Red Skelton and Jack Benny, and uh, they kept Ed Sullivan going. But uh, Paley was worried CBS became a rural network. Levin was embarrassed by World Championship Wrestling. He, how is he going to explain to his friends that he had wrestling on? It's wrestling. That's lowbrow entertainment, except the problem with wrestling, it made a lot of money. And um, Harvey Schiller told me the story, and other people have told me the story, that um, Levin calls uh, Harvey and uh, Eric Bischoff, Bischoff, rather, and a couple other people into his office. He said, uh, he calls him and said, I want to meet with you on such and such a date. We got to talk about things. And they all thought that Levin, Levin was going to call them in to congratulate them, to a pat on the back. What a good job you guys are doing. But no, Levin called them in to say, I'm canceling the show. Could have done that by telephone rather easily. He's canceling the most successful show financially on the whole spectrum of Turner. Why is he doing this? Because his friends were embarrassed. Levin did one other thing, too. CNN, when it started, was all news and no nonsense. One of the first hires that Ted Turner made for CNN was Daniel Shore. Uh, I do uh, talks, uh, library talks up in uh, Roseland, New Jersey. And uh, one of Daniel Shore's cousins uh, comes to my talks over in uh, Livingston, New Jersey at the library. And uh, she was telling me that Daniel Shore wasn't particularly a pleasant guy, particularly around the Jewish holidays, uh, when there was Passover Seder. And she said, you always have to watch out for Daniel Shore because he had sharp elbows. He had sharp elbows, whatever that meant. <laughs> he wasn't really too nice a guy. In fact, he wasn't a nice guy, which made him a great, great, great reporter. Uh, while he was at CBS, he became an essayist for Ted Turner. And uh, you might remember this when Richard Nixon put together his uh, enemies list. Daniel Shore was at the top or near the top of Richard Nixon's enemy list. I dealt with Nixon. Oh, I knew Nixon. I did know Nixon from 85 to 88. Uh, Nixon came back into prominence uh, as a senior statesman after being the arbitrator of Major League Baseball owners, Major League Baseball umpires dispute. Um, so he gets rid of that show. He also does another thing. Ted Turner liked Larry King. Larry King was on, you know, nine o'clock every night. And uh, it was the only gap show that uh, Ted Turner had. It was the only show that uh, 
to you know, Larry wasn't exactly Edward R. Morrow. Um, nobody would ever confuse Larry with Huntley or Brinkley or anybody of that ilk. You know, Larry was, uh, as, he, as the old neighborhood uh, in Brooklyn, Larry was basically in Yenton. That's all he was. Um, you know, he was over, he was at uh, Mutual Radio and Ted heard him on Mutual, um, you know, after a night of uh, being at Duke Siebert's bar in Washington, D.C., get over to Arlington, uh, about a mile and a half away. And uh, one of the Castleberries, whether it was Todd or Chris, we'd get them all set up and he'd do the radio show. And Ted liked the radio show, so he put it on TV and did basically the same thing. Uh, it was a gap show. It was a gap fest. It wasn't a hard news show, and CNN was hard news. Levin liked Larry King's show, and Levin decided to make the turn from hard news to more happy talk type news. Uh, and Ted had happy talk news on headline news. Um, he had a good news show at one point. Nothing but good news. Uh, but news depends on bad things, as Dick Young, the uh, columnist uh, for the New York Daily News, who I didn't particularly like personally, but respected because he was Dick Young, and, and, and he, he started in the 1940s and was highly successful as a blunt columnist. But as Dick Young once said, there are eight, 8 million stories in the naked city, and only about 5,000 of them are worth talking about. That's the news. So CNN under Gerald Levin would move from absolute news coverage, both on headline news and on CNN, to punditry. Uh, I was a pundit on uh, ABC's News Now, and I was a pundit on uh, MSNBC. And they tell you, don't worry about facts, just make good TV. So CNN went from facts to making good TV. Fox does the same thing. MSNBC does the same thing. That's the format of cable TV news. It takes from, uh, cable, uh, from talk radio, borrows that format, but it's mostly punditry now and people just yelling at each other. He's this, uh, AT and rather before at t Time Warner sold off the National Hockey League's Atlanta Thrashers franchise, the National Basketball Association's Atlanta Hawks, the Major League Baseball Atlanta Braves, uh, they decided that TBS shouldn't be a super station anymore. Uh, Harvey Schiller's division now uh, was Turner Sports. They did not renew the NBA TV, uh, NFL, National Football League TV deal. They still have a deal with the National Basketball Association. So they start selling that stuff off. Uh, on January 11th, 2001, Time Warner was purchased by AOL, became AOL Time Warner. Everybody thought that was going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Vertical integration, all of this other stuff. And even Ted Turner thought it was going to be a great thing. But there was the burst of the dot-com bubble. That hurt the growth and probability, profitability of AOL. Another thing that hurt AOL was not going to broadband. AOL didn't think very highly of this, nor did it think very highly of um, wire, uh, rather of, of, of the broadband. They, they thought, you know, hey, there are a lot of people who like the telephone line going into the house. Eventually they would have to sell off the AOL division because they, didn't, they weren't doing very well. They were doing poorly as a matter of fact. Um, and it failed. It's one of the biggest failures in American business history. Uh, in the fall of 2001, at a board meeting, Turner let loose on Gerald Levin. Levin would eventually resign and would be replaced by Richard Parsons. Gerald Levin was not a good steward of CNN. Uh, he left uh, the Turner movie classic alone and, and some of the other things, but in terms of, uh, of CNN and other, and other Turner projects, he was absolutely awful. And by 2002, he's gone. Um, Turner, um, Turner was involved in everything, in everything. And yet, uh, Levin um, said, we don't need you. We don't need you at all. Goodbye, farewell, do something else. Parsons invited Turner back for strategic advice, but uh, Turner never got an operational role. The company would drop AOL from its name in 2003, just became Time Warner. And AOL was such a toxic name by uh, December 2009 
that Time Warner just got rid of it. Uh, and now uh, it's part of uh, Verizon along with Yahoo. Um, AOL, um, it's, its fall is absolutely amazing. Uh, AOL had uh, instant messaging. Uh, Yahoo had instant messaging. They had the idea before Mark Zuckerberg uh, and uh, the Harvard people had Facebook. They could have been Facebook. They couldn't figure it out. AOL can never figure out what it was supposed to be. And today, it's you know you can get mail and get some information from AOL. I think part of it is still a subscription that you have to uh, pay for AOL, and it's it's in a package with Verizon and Yahoo. Uh, Verizon did buy out AOL and Yahoo. The assets of those two companies is now known as Oath, A U T H. Ted Turner predicted the demise of newspapers 30 years ago. He called print journalism an obsolete way of distributing information. And in a lot of ways, he was right. Uh, I was a newspaper person, um, and then a radio person, and did TV, and wrote in magazines, and, um, and wrote op-ed pieces for New York Newsday, and um, the Bergen Record, and the San Francisco Examiner, and the Orlando Sentinel and wrote uh, pieces that appeared in OI. I was translated and it was in um, the Spanish newspaper OI. And uh, Turner was right about that. The newspapers always survived. They outlived radio as far as information. They outlived television, but they could not outlive the internet. Uh, and the internet would basically wipe out newspapers uh, in journalism and send it to a secondary status. Uh, but Turner seems to have had buyer's remorse. Uh, even though he amassed a great deal of properties, he was critical of media consolidation, starting in around 2004 after he couldn't get back in to his child. He was an orphan, or the child was an orphan. He expressed regret that he took advantage of the relaxed rules, the 1984 uh, Cable TV Act that allowed greater concentration of media ownership. And he also expressed concerns about the quality of information and debate, which goes on on CNN or MSNBC or on Fox, uh, in the environment where news is controlled by a few corporate entities and individuals. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was out on the five towns out in Long Island, Woodmere, that area giving a talk to a seniors group. And um, there was a guy who had been in the United Nations as an attache uh, from India, and he settled on Long Island. And he used to come to all my talks. And I used to do uh, talks at a particular place four times, five times a year, over a 52-week uh, span. And sometimes I talked about the media. And he was talking about his days in the United Nations when there were just 37 people globally who controlled the news. And he would moan about what was going on in the United States. And he said, look who controls the news. This is about 2005, 2006. He said, AOL Time Warner. He said uh, it was GE, NBC, General Electric at that point, NBC. Uh, also Disney, ABC, Viacom, CBS, and Rupert Mur Murdoch Fox. Those were the big five on TV. Secondarily, you had the New York Times and the Washington Post and nothing on radio. And he said that we have too little, too, too many, too few viewpoints. And you look at cable TV news, it's Fox, it's MSG, MSG, MSNBC, and CNN for the most part. There's also fringe stuff uh, uh, out there as well, including Newsmax, which I did some... Uh, on air commentary for this friend of mine was uh, hosting a show uh, over there. But uh, it is a problem. There are too few people who really run the media now. Far too few people who run the media. And Ted started talking about that. Uh, he was the chairman of the Turner Foundation, founded in 1990, which supports uh, efforts for improving air and water quality as he got into environmentalism, developing a sustainable energy future to protect our climate, safeguarding environmental health, maintaining wildlife uh, habitat protection. He has a lot of land in Montana, which is uh, habitat. 
and uh, developing practices and po uh, policies to curb population growth rates. He's also a rest restaurateur, that's Ted's Montana Grill in Manhattan, and there are Montana Grills elsewhere. Uh, he's got two million acres of personal and ranch land. He's the second largest individual land owner in North America. And uh, he's involved with economic viability along with ecological sustainability. Uh, he is now 82 years old. He is not doing all that well. He's ill. Um, the ranch is a uh, working business. There's bison, hunting, fishing, ecotourism, as well as principal enterprises on the ranch. And he supports many progressive environmental projects, including water resource, timber management, and the reintroduction of native species to the land. He has about 51,000 bison across his ranches. And uh, he changed your life. And um, he, um, he did a lot. He's not doing too much anymore anymore. And some of his uh, projects have been watered down. And one other story about Harvey Schiller before I leave you, because Harvey worked for Ted and is a friend of mine. Uh, and Harvey was a guy who flew uh, missions in Vietnam around 1967, 68, somewhere around there. Ted married Jane Fonda. And uh, Jane Fonda, of course, sat in a, on a tank in Hanoi in 1972, criticizing American military involvement in North and South Vietnam. And uh, Ted would marry Jane Fonda. And he would take Jane to all kind of enterprises and, and activities, and Harvey would go there too. And Jane would see Harvey, she found out about his background, and would run the other way. Just run the other way. And um, Harvey got tired of that and said to Jane one day, Jane, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop. When I joined the Air Force, I took an oath to defend all Americans, 48 states, all the territories. That's my job, to defend what you said. May not like what you said, but that's my job. You did what you did, I did what I did. So instead of every time you see me and run away, say hi, and we'll leave it at that. It's my friend Harvey. And I told that to some vets. And the vets were talking about that uh, back to me because I did this on, on the ship. And they said, Harvey is a better man than I ever could because I could never forgive Jane Fonda. But Harvey's a good man because Harvey could do that. And um, Harvey and Jeff Grimshaw and Jack Kelly and a whole bunch of people I know that worked over for Ted told me that if he ever wanted a boss, Ted was the best. He let you work. You did your job well. He never interfered with what you did. And uh, Ted was very successful. But Ted was a gambler. Ted rolled the dice. And Ted's one of those, uh, those guys who is uh, recognized as a pioneer of cable television with Bill Rasmussen, who put together ESPN. Uh, Bill took ESPN. Uh, same role, the same method as Ted Turner. He wanted to start a uh, sports channel in Connecticut, and he talked to the satellite people and said, why just Connecticut? To rent the satellite, go across the country. That's how ESPN started. That's what Ted did. Uh, a whole bunch of things uh, happened uh, with Ted, uh, with Chuck Dolan, who started HBO roughly around that time, and um, uh, Ted Rogers up in uh, Canada, and Bill Daniels with TCI. Uh, these were all the pioneers. And TCI, they were the cable operators. Ted Rogers, he was the cable operator. Uh, and Ted cut deals with all these people. And Ted supplied the programming. And the programming is still there today. And Ted's, Ted's uh, ideas are still there. They may not be the same as Ted was back then, uh, particularly in the news division. And, and he thinks that there should be new, more, far more news that's being told than the commentary. And I happen to agree with him as a, as a guy who walked the streets and, and did news in the streets. That's what I did. But that was Ted. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Sharon. I want to thank uh, Darren for inviting me and, and everybody else. And uh, if you have anything to say, say it now, or as they say, forever hold your peace. Um, we can open up uh, and uh, unmute everybody. Um, yeah, I think everybody, but Carl's muted. So um, Carl can unmute. Any questions or any comments before we leave? No questions, no comments. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Sharon, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. It was very interesting, actually. So thank you and, so and much. You're of, you're, and you're of the generation that came after cable TV started. Yeah. You have no idea that there was nothing on TV prior to that. Well, there was limited prior to this. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, I will send you the video. And uh, okay, we will great. be talking. And thanks, everybody, for... Um,